Welcome to another episode of the Unbound Book Babes. We are here to talk about the film adaptation, eh, the film adaptation of Poor Things. Oh, there's going to be a lot in this episode. We have a lot of thoughts about the book, the movie, and just the themes that are within. Kristen, before we jump yes, into the synopsis, what what were your feelings about the book? Like, how how what did you do? You like? Did you dislike the book? Okay, I'm gonna try to do this without any spoilers since we're in the first like 12 seconds. But um, I the big the first part of the book so hard to get through. I had zero clue who anybody was, what was going on. I just kept like reading word after word like someday this will all make sense the middle part of the book was a wild fucking ride um i love the ending the yeah. third part uh loved it and now you did the audiobook correct i did uh so in the written book it has pictures of body parts like like hearts and spines and other things that I don't know what their names are. Like, I don't know what they are based on just the picture, so I don't know <laughs> what else there was. Um, and I, I did spend a lot of time trying to figure out why each one was put there. Because in one chapter it was two spinal, two vertebrae. And then like a couple of chapters later it was three, but I wasn't smart enough to connect the dots there as to what anything may have meant so it was just a weird gross picture for me <laughs> i well, i would share your breakdown part one i remember being like what in the absolute heck is happening right now like trying to follow everything and then part two i remember calling you a couple times during like like the first 20 percent to probably like the 80 percent of the book and just like making a couple comments about like this is something wild and bizarre um and then part three i remember just like calling you and being like I never saw that coming. Holy freaking crap. This is, this just made the entire book worth cr crawling through because e I tried to, I started to read it. I read like four pages and I said, no, thank you. I can't do this, but I really want to see the movie and I want to read the book first. So I am going to try the audiobook. In the audiobook, um, Really quick, some contextual information about the book is that it takes place, part of it at least takes place, uh, I guess a, a sort of majority of it is set in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, so there's Scottish accents and in the audiobook there is, is, be, it is a Scottish narrator. Uh, I, or at least I presume them to be, because it sounded pretty authentic to me. Um, and Kristen and I actually, when we went to, um, we went to Ireland and Scotland, and we spent a very short period of time in Glasgow area. Maybe I'll pop a couple pictures in of like, because we went to the Pot Still, which is a a really great whiskey bar in Glasgow. We walked around the streets a little bit. We saw Highland Cows, my twin. We'll just put a picture right here of me, my, my twin. twin. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, anyway, so like having been around Glasgow for like a day, we weren't there a long time, but seeing the buildings and everything, it actually was really nice to, that I rolled right into that book after I kind of got home. That was the second book I read, or listened to rather in this case, when we got home. So like I could get the vibes, you know, the Scottish vibes of it. Um, but yeah, it was quite, quite the ride. And we'll get into more of that shortly. But um, let me go ahead and read the synopsis of Poor Things to you. One of Alistair Gray's most brilliant creations, 
Poor Things is a postmodern revision of Frankenstein that replaces a traditional monster with Bella Baxter, a beautiful young erotomaniac brought back to life with the brain of an infant. Godwin Baxter's scientific ambition to create the perfect companion is realized when he finds the drowned body of Bella, but his dream is thwarted by Dr. Archibald McCandless. Jealous love... Oh, oh, that's going to be hard to say. Okay, hold on just a second, y'all. But his dream is thwarted by Dr. Archibald McCandless jealous love for Baxter's creation. There's a lot of S's on that, <laughs> which are not my strong suit. If you've heard me talk about my speech impediment, <laughs> the, <Another> little snake. <laughs> <laughs> the hilarious tale of love and scandal that ensues would be the whole story in the hands of a lesser author, which in fact it is for this account is actually written by Dr. McCandless. For Gray, though, this is only half of the story, after which Bella, aka Victoria McCandless, has her own say in the matter. Satirizing the classical Victorian novel, Poor Things is a hilarious political allegory and a thought-provoking duel between the desires of man and the independence of women from one of Scotland's most accomplished authors. Whew. Whew. I mean, if I would have read this prior to picking up this book, I don't know if I would have read it. Do you feel like the book accomplishes everything that this particular description Yeah, actually, I think that the last part, this, like, creating satire of, you know, a classic and Victorian novel, and I do see the political and thought-provoking duology, mm -hmm. because one of the things, I think I was, like, 20% of the way through the book, and I called you, and I remember saying something along the lines of, I feel like this book is written to perpetuate the stereotypical narrative that women are whores, vilifying women's own sexual curiosity as told by a man. And all, and you had already finished the book at this point, <laughs> and I just remember you cackling because I had not gotten to the final part of the book. Um, yeah. And so it just, I truly do think that it create. and yesterday uh, when I got home from seeing the movie, I ended up doing a little bit of digging on the author himself, and I kind of have some thoughts about him too, but I think they'll come up at a different Ooh. time in this conversation, so. Although it's supposed to be, like, satirical and a political allegory, do you think the book is, like, a feminist revolution in sexuality? Just, just one sec. I will answer that. <laughs> Heidi says, that's such a dumb question. I won't even grant it a response. No, it's not. Okay, so I just wanted to give the definition of what allegory is. An allegory is a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. Just because, like, I had to Google that. <laughs> like, I... Here and not along, mm -hmm. but actually I'm very appreciative that you Googled it because all I know is that Animal Farm is an allegory, but I didn't know that exact definition. Yes, yeah. So like, <laughs> I, that's kind of what I was thinking too. <laughs> like, I know other things that have been described as that, so I can kind of like contextually understand, but what does it actually mean? So yeah. your question to me was, do I think that the book... It's like a feminist statement on female sexuality. I do. Do you think there's... You do. I do. I was reading your notes and I was like, oh, we're going to have some conflicting thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Here's why. And maybe it would help just to like jump into the discussion about the movie, perhaps. But in the movie... 
or, so let's go to the book. Let's focus on the book because that's what your true question was, was about the book. So in the book, Bella Baxter's character is, we are led to believe that Bella Baxter's character is a woman who like a frankenstein oh sorry nope nope not going that direction <laughs> no i mean yes it is a frankenstein it's essentially a like it says a postmodern frankenstein retelling uh re-envision yeah. it's exactly what it is the thing about it though is that bella's character is so lives lives in honesty lives in truth like she has no true filter she has no perception of the world outside of this very small narrow tunnel that she ha has been in that or that's our perception of her at least and mm -hmm. she just speaks the truth says her feelings and is not sh does not feel shame for those things. It talks about her being this erotomaniac and she's like, furious jumping is fun. I don't know what to tell you. Like, <laughs> I just don't know what to tell you. It's fun. It makes me happy. Why is that a bad thing? And and she doesn't even, and she doesn't even necessarily question it. She's just is like, you're uncomfortable with it. That's your problem. So this is why I think it actually is like this feminine, feminist, like a, uh, element because it's it's so much we see so many men in this world get away with saying shit we see in like <laughs> not being held accountable for for things and just being like this is who i am take it or leave it why can't a woman do that because we're supposed to be seen as like this um meek child bearing listen and, and follow all the rules and that is not what bella is she is i'm gonna do whatever i want and i'm gonna have fun doing it and if you judge me that says more about you than it does me and i fucking love that vibe <laughs> i agree i do agree with all of that the one downside though is that it's in like a childish way because they put the chi the brain of an unformed, like an unformed fetus brain into a grown woman's head. The only reason, like, it's like that freedom of being a child to be that honest in the body of a woman. Um, and that's, that's just an aspect of this book that I can't get over. It's creepy. Over. It's creepy. It's... You know, so it's this weird, like, Frankenstein meets the island of Dr. Moreau that gives her this freedom to be honest and chase what makes her happy. It's just so bizarre that I can't... I think that that all, her being a... Tr like this child brain in this woman, I think is a metaphor for the perception of man um, and how they think we are less than, like we are equivalent to, like intelli intellectually less than, and that they their main perception is that women are, are on this, in, intellectually on the same level as children. Hmm. I think that that's what that metaphor is trying to swage us to understand see that that does make it a little bit more interesting right but then it goes a step further with good godwin baxter and him doing those types of experiments on animals mm -hmm. so him seeing no difference between an animal and a woman and mm -hmm. a child whatever he wants to play with yep. and experiment on <laughs> yep Ex exactly like Man is king. Man can get away and do whatever they want to these lesser, these lesser beings. These poor things. These poor things. Exactly. <laughs> There's the reason for a name in, in this story, right? And I think it's really interesting because I was listening to some interviews from the cast this morning. And I was, because I was just like so curious where they're at with it right because this movie is wild and we'll get into it shortly i know you guys but like trust that i had like this movie was spoiler i enjoyed it very much 
I enjoyed the movie. Really? I did. This is why I said we're going to have conflicting thoughts. <laughs> so, now I'm fascinated. So, oh, shit. I forgot names. Let me open up the... Stone, Mark Ruffalo, and... I forgot who played Godwin. Uh... Yeah, but I want um, Rami Youssef. He played Max McCandles in the story mm. who um, they changed the first name of McCandless. Um, and I guess the last name kind of too. I didn't even notice that. That's so weird. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed it yesterday when I was like doing some research about the characters and the story and stuff. Because again, I didn't see spellings. Uh, Cause mm -hmm. I listened. So then I was like, these are different. Anyways. Um, so Emma Stone plays Bella Baxter. William Defoe plays Godwin Baxter. Why is Mark not on this list? Oh, he is. He's why is he so far down on the list? Is this alphabetical? It doesn't matter. Anyways, Mark Ruffalo plays uh Duncan Wedderburn. And then Remy Youssef plays Mac Mac Max McCandles. In in a interview, Remy says that he and his character is actually very different in the movie than it is in the book, in my opinion. Would you agree with that? Um, I feel like they made a part for him in the in the movie because he doesn't really have that mm -hmm. big of a role in the book. Yeah, right. Like he's just the epitome of a background character. Yes, but he his reaction to things is very different in the movie from the book, and we can get into a couple specific scenes with that. But he goes on to say that his he. He, and when he said this, it kind of clicked for me. The way he said this was so beautiful. And I'll link the interview that I, I watched in the description. Um, he says that every male character in this story personifies one element that all men carry. And he says that my character in the movie played the role of coming to terms with some of the things that Bella did and letting them go and not worrying about them. Where, like, um, Mark Ruffalo... Oh, yeah, he's stuck with his last name. Ruffalo? Is it Ruffalo? Mark Ruffalo? Ruffalo. Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. Mark Ruffalo is, like, that narcissistic, territorial, um, egotistical ass... And William Dafoe is that kind of like nurturing father um, guidance, I guess. Yeah. So I thought that was very curious that he said that because it's so true. Even in the book, when you look at all the different male characters, even the ones like that she um, like... Harry Astley that she meets on the boat. He's he's doing this very cynical, very um, uh, dark, pessimistic view. And then you have the other gentleman that's on the boat, the doctor, and he's like, you know, things are good. God is good. These are, you know, spiritual and hopeful. You have these juxtapositions. You have all these different elements. So all these characters kind of personify different elements of what, like, what one individual complete human man would be. <laughs> and I found that fascinating when he said that. I was like, oh, he's super, he's correct. He's super, super right in that. And I like that they stuck with that, like the one character being one perceived take on being a male is very clever. Yeah. It, and, you know, it's really important, you know, in books and movies that if you're going to introduce a character, they have to provide like a, they have to provide something to the main character, right? And so each each man that they introduce is purposely adding to who Bella Baxter is as she grows and changes, right? And mm -hmm. so the one on the boat, was it Harry, you said? Yes. Um, he's the one that I found super interesting because for how pessimistic he was, 
he was totally fine with the world being that way, mm -hmm. right? Like, this is just the way the world is. And then he would go on to list all of these terrible things that happened to women and children and animals and poor people. And he was, and she's like, we should do something. And he's like, no, that's just the way it is. Like, mm -hmm. why would you change it? If you change it, I'd have to like relearn what the world is like. I'm comfortable because I know what to expect. And you're like, yeah, you know, it Touché. was, <laughs> he was telling all these terrible things as if they were in the book. He told them as if they were good. Like these are good things mm -hmm. almost. If, and that part, that part I had to read a couple times. Cause I was like, he really does like that things are terrible because he's a pessimist. Mm hmm. Because I want to talk about, like, obviously you read a book and then, like, we all want to see the movie. But I feel like I have to give myself a disclaimer of, like, books and movies are different mediums. Mm -hmm. Ergo, stories must be told in different fashions. And yeah. I have to remind myself that in order to convey feelings and create characters, um, you have to like expect different things and they have to do different things. Um, however, I feel like that Goodreads synopsis leaves a lot, like it's not for the movie, but um, it leaves a lot to be desired in the movie because I feel like the movie missed out on a lot of things. Some of my favorite scenes. <laughs> yeah. What, what were some of the scenes that you missed? So obviously part three of the book. Yes. But <laughs> one of... If we're going to talk about this being, like, a feminist movie, right? Or a feminist book and, and freeing of women. There's a scene in the book where Bella and Mark Ruffalo's character. What's his name again? And Duncan Wedderburn. Duncan. So Bella and Duncan are on that boat, and Duncan is gambling away all of their money, right? He wins a little bit, and then... Somebody on the boat, I think it's the girl, uh, the old lady, um, in the book, pulls her aside and is like, hey man, when he's passed out, you should steal some of, or like, hide some of his money. So that way when he gambles it all away and you guys have lost everything, you will still have money to, like, keep going on your travels. And Bella's like, oh, that's a great idea. So she hides some of that money, so that way when they get off the boat... They're, she's like, oh, um, he's like, oh, we're, because he does inevitably gamble all of their money away. So they get off the boat and he's like a broken man being like, we have nowhere to go. I failed you. And so then Bella is like, I'm going to go into the city and I will find a way for us to get money. So in the book, she goes in, she has a cappuccino. She has a great day, just like sightseeing by herself. And then she comes back and says, Look at all this money. We can get a hotel for the night. And Duncan is like, oh, no, you had to go whore yourself out. I feel so bad. Ho hum. Anyways, off to the hotel. And they like and then later on in the book, he finds out that she had, quote unquote, stolen that money from him. And he loses his mind. He's more upset that she stole from him and outwitted him on the boat than he was when he found out that she had whored herself out. Mm-hmm. And in the movie, they completely contorted this scene. They did. Where she donates all that money to poor people and then goes and truly whores herself out. Yeah. Yeah, I so, think... I would agree. That was a missed opportunity because it. I think that really... Sh that, that particular series of events in the books really does show, like, this patriarchal perception of oh well women are just whores, so of course she did that but uh oh you're gonna lie and steal from me to protect me against myself you don't have the authority to do that over me yeah i mean now in both in both of them she does end up working at a brothel right yeah. so but it, i don't know man it seems like the parts of the book that <laughs> I have such an off-topic thought. It's not super off-topic. It's about the poor things, but... 
sorry. One thing about the movie is the amount of nudity that is in it. Oh, yeah. I Oh, yeah. I have never... I don't think I have ever seen peen in, <laughs> in a movie like I did in Poor Things. Oh, yeah. That was just a straight-up poor... I was like... <laughs> I had no idea. I did not know I was going to see that much of the Emma Stone. I did not know I was going to see those many peens. The scene <laughs> where she's in the surgery and she's like <coughs> with one on the dead guy and then stabs his eyes. I was like, <gasps> I, I, <laughs> Jacob went to this movie with me because he, he didn't read the book. He was just like, yeah, I'll go with you. No. I was like, it's going to be weird. He's like, okay, that's cool. And so like, and I was like, I looked at him. I was like, that didn't happen in the book. <laughs> it did not. It did not. <laughs> and then, and then when she, when they're like walking through the park and he's like, Bella, look, a frog. And I was like, she's going to fucking kill it. She's going to kill it. Sure as shit. <laughs> Like, oh my God. <laughs> but just the shock and awe of some of these scenes I was like what the fuck what's happening <laughs> <laughs> sorry Chris I didn't even interrupt you but that just popped in my no, head it was, <laughs> it was a lot <laughs> the movie itself the imagery the you know and aside from my feelings about the book and the movie Emma Stone did a wonderful job um, being like, you know, the the choppy movements of learning how to walk in a new body type of thing, growing and changing, and wow. Yeah. yeah. Also, I really want one of those jackets with the big giant ruffle sleeves on it. <laughs> love that. I love that so much. <laughs> yeah, the, the costume and set designers freak in the cinematography the cinematographer was robbie roberts and uh fantastic such such good like i loved and so this is i actually have a prediction for movies going forward now especially after we i've seen this one and the barbie movie so much of the movie um was i wrote this down just as let me find where i put it though the movie is very reminiscent of, um, like, with the filming, the lighting, different camera angles, different lens usage, was very reminiscent of, like, Trip to the Moon by, um, I'm going to muff up his name so bad, George, George is Melee's? Is, is a 1902 movie called Trip to the Moon. And it is in that whole era of movies, like the early 1900s to the mid 1900s. I really just feel like it took me right back to that. And like my film is lit class and understanding like what the music is doing, what the different camera angles are doing and trying to invoke these different emotions or thoughts out of you and stuff like that. Um, very well done. My prediction for movies in the future is that they're going to be more old school theatrical style, like more curiosity building. Because I also know that like the Barbie movie used a lot of like old school set design and tools rather than CGI. So like in Poor Things, a lot of like the sky imagery is very bizarre. A lot of the imagery is just kind of... Kind of like whimsical, right? Kind of like if a child was seeing the world for the first time, it's yes, extra bright, extra large, extra... Yes. It's just extra. It is. <laughs> and But it's very almost like set. Uh, like a theater set design almost too. Like it almost looks like some of these things are like rolled in and then the set changes and it's rolled out kind of thing. One of the things in the interviews that I watched that I thought was really fantastic was the fact that um, like on the boat when 
she's like reading with her new friends and Mark Ruffield or Duncan Wedderburn comes out there and he starts like throwing her books overboard. Um, the sky, what they, that's actually a giant LCD screen or LED screen. It's not CGI. And they did have to extend it in a part. Like they took it and they extended it in post-production because it wasn't like large enough to whatever. But um, they took images of the sky and then images of water and then different colors and they kind of like mesh them together um i'm assuming in like a photoshop style thing i don't know um and they used that on a giant screen instead of like using cgi hollywood really has to find a way to evolve right um especially with tiktok and youtube especially tiktok we are seeing that the common person with an iPhone is making some of the most amazing. I mean, granted, it's a 30 second video, but they've made 500 of them, right? Mm -hmm. And they're using CGI or, you know, mm -hmm. just your run of the mill software. And they are making videos as good as Hollywood. So I think Hollywood has to go back to these really expensive set designs in order to differentiate and not compete with what people can do like with the phone in their pocket right? yeah like if it's just me by myself i can't roll in ocean waves from two different angles right like they did in the barbie movie with those sets they're rolling in and yep. stuff like yeah they they have to evolve and change because they literally can't compete with a 12 year old kid in his bedroom that's just playing around with software <laughs> yeah exactly bobby what was your least favorite part of the movie uh <laughs> um least favorite part of the movie what a great question honestly i do not do well with gore like mm, literally yeah. at all i'm all stabbing <laughs> uh that wasn't too bad because they didn't really like show it like, going into the eyeball, it was just, like, a side angle. But, like, like the, the lungs or the liver in the body, and then, like, when they were doing the surgeries and cutting and pulling and slicing the brain, and, hmm, nope. <laughs> I have a, she works in the medical field, and she'll, like, or tell, tell me about different procedures, just so, like, I'm, a, I'm aware of them, because I often go to her with medical questions, because, you know, like, <laughs> doctors take up too much of my time just like <gasps> deep breath <gasps> don't throw up <laughs> <laughs> so like that i was not those were not my favorite parts of the movie like this the the gross mm -mm. <laughs> how'd you feel about the fish eye lens back to cinematography i guess i thought the scenes where it was used was really clever I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that might be coming. <laughs> I also thought it was overused, but... I could see that. I could see that. Um, I keep thinking about the books, like throwing the books off the boat, one, because what an atrocity, <laughs> first off, littering, second off, the poor books. Um, but... I thought that was cool because the the scene right before is such a wide angle lens. You get this really cool image of like the 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 railing of the bow in the second level above. You get like this really crazy wide angle, and then all of a sudden it focuses down on um, Duncan with his head cut off with this umbrella cutting his head off. So it's just this male body getting mad and ripping and throwing this book. And I thought that was so good because you know in that moment, he was so angry that his vision was narrowed. Like his thought, his, he was just like, he was feeling frustrated and like he was losing control of Bella and that you know, so I really think it um, like heightened your impression of how he was feeling in that moment, at least in that particular scene with with the uses of the fisheye. So I thought it was extremely clever 
uh, to use it there. Some of the other scenes where it was like, um, like the black and white fisheye, like from above. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember what scene this was. I can't, I can't recall. But like, there was a lot of, of that being used, I think, to like really narrow. But I always thought it was curious because like when you're in Bella's, kind of going back to what you said, like it's very whimsical. Like it's from a child's, almost like it's from a child's point of view of this vast world. So everything from Bella's point of view was this wide, broad, beautiful, the colors, the costumes. But then a lot of times when it came to the male perspective, it shrunk into this fisheye, this distortion of the world and this very narrow viewpoint of it. So I thought, and I actually made the comment in my notes is that, the underlying themes, I think, were still in the movie, but done in a different way. And I think it was done through this the use of this wide angle versus this fish fish eye lens and and stuff like that. So, like, um, you know, the underlying theme. You know, I go be going back to the comment that I made when I called you. Is this? Is it this? perpetuating the stereotypical narrative that women are whores and vilifying women's sexual curiosity and just their independence in general, because a lot of this actually has to do with the women, women's independence in making her own decisions. It just hyper-focuses on the sexuality of it. Um, I think that the underlying theme is just that weak and insecure men cannot accept that women can be brilliant, sexual, and curious beings. And that I do agree that the movie is basically a theatrical portal. Um, <laughs> I also think it showed the underlying theme in a very different way than the book. So the uh, McCandle's character never shamed Bella for her promiscuity when she worked in the brothel. So like when she brings this up to him in the movie, he's like, I'm, I'm more just jealous of your time with those other men. I am not... He's like, it's your body. You can do with it what you want. But before we get married and, and do that ourselves, can you please get checked out? Like, kind of thing. <laughs> um, and so in the book, he has a mental break and drink gets drunk off port. And, like, has this, like, weird, like, screaming, like, chaotic mental break, it seems, in the book. I also think that, the, that um, Harry... The gentleman on the boat, you know, he's calling out Mark's character. He's saying like, oh, she can't have friends. Oh, she can't be curious. Yeah. Oh, she can't do this. Oh, why are you being a, a, a tyrannical misogynist, you know, to, to this delightful, young, beautiful mind, you know? Um, yeah. And I think at the end of the movie... I love that at the end of the movie, she turns this one specific tyrant into a goat. <laughs> so I do think that the underlying themes of the book are still in the movie. They're just definitely, like you said in the beginning, it's a different medium. You have to have that disclaimer to yourself that it's not going to be exact. And I do, I did really get frustrated with how the movie ended because we miss a whole five minute chunk. And I think it could have been done in a five minute chunk because the movie's already two and a half hours long like holy crap right it's a long movie um, i mean if you were to cut out the sex scenes though that would have been what like an hour long movie perhaps <laughs> you know on the on the topic of like female sexuality though i feel like obviously it was written by a man obviously this whole movie was done like by men um and so I feel like we're getting the perception of female sexuality again through that male lens. Mm -hmm. So the scene that I just thought was so absurd was when she discovered that like she could shove stuff in up inside of her mm -hmm. and be like, wow, I get so happy. She yeah. started with an apple <laughs> and I was like, I was like that's your choice. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, obviously, that's how men explore their sexuality, right? They mm -hmm. will stick their dick in anything. Vacuum cleaner hose, apple pie, loaf of bread, like, anything at all, I right? Like the American I mean, we Pie reference. Pie... 
<laughs> yeah. It's an entire movie series created around the idea of that's how men explore their sexuality. Yeah. And to put that, like, to me, it was obviously like, okay, you don't get how a woman explores her sexuality. Because I'm going to tell you what, kid. No. <laughs> yeah. I think that there are... I think there's obviously a spectrum in both regards, right? But I think it was very much leaning towards the masculine view of female sexuality. And I think that that actually is follows the book very well. I think that specific item follows the book very well because in the book we're we're you know we're being told all of this from McCandle's uh, perspective and you know the movie is actually from Bella's perspective, but it still kind of made me feel like I was being told it from McCandle's perspective. So yeah, okay. So one last question because this is, seems to be kind of like an overarching. For me, it's, it's, uh, how do I want to say this? It's this idea or theology that this book cannot shake, right? Is the idea of like pedophilia and growing. Um, it's a grown man who finds a dead woman and puts the brain of an infant into her body, right? So is that, it's not necessarily pedophilia, but there's an, uh, an idea of in there of you're taking something that is unintelligent and doesn't know anything about the world and obviously the way it's told from McCandless in the book is that Goodwin raised her in hopes of her being his mistress you know and mm -hmm. like obviously everybody's trying to take advantage of her because she's not fully developed yeah that doesn't have a fully developed brain. The line in the movie when Max McCandles first meets Bella and he goes, I hate this word, so please forgive me. What a beautiful retard. I was like, oh, <laughs> no, he did not. <laughs> I was just like shocked. I was like, he did not just say that. But then I'm like, that's what a lot of men fucking see in women. Beautiful retards. Like, I'm sorry. Like, it, is, it is an apt turn. When, when, when my friends tell me about their dating app experiences or I read screenshots online, you know, some of them could be made up, right? But, like, you're like, do these men think we're that fucking dumb? Like. <laughs> they do. Yeah. So... You said one last question. I'm not sure if I got a question out of that, so I want to make sure that you did at get a chance to ask it. Oh, it was a fairly long-winded question. It was like I was asking a political question. Um, do you think this book... <laughs> Sorry. Like, do you think it circumvents... I don't know. There's just... I guess I didn't really <clears throat> ask a question. I just had a long, rambling statement and then was like... What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> Which is perfect. That's what I was just clarifying to make sure that that's what we were, we were, the path we're going down, right? Because I, I have yeah. the same, I had, you know, in this book, I was like very worried about, you know, the, the, the unclean narrative of an adolescent mind being in a adult, fully developed and matured female body. Um, so I did a little bit of digging on Alistair Gray, and I want to tell you a little bit about the author, because I think this really opened my eyes and actually made me respect where he was going with that. So, uh, Alistair Gray, he was born in 1932, and he died in uh, 2019. Uh, what? what was he? Uh, 80, 70, 80, 90. I don't know. God damn it. Make me do math. 
I don't know. That's a long life. It just didn't seem like those were realistic years. That's wild. I don't know how time works. Oh, right. 87. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And so he was born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland. So he's a he's Scottish. He's actually coined with like reviving Scottish literature. And he is, he's described to be a postmodern writer like that of Franz Kafka and George Orwell. And when I saw those two names, because I've read both, some of both of their works, Kafka, he's a German writer. He's actually, when I was taking some of my German classes in college, we had to read and study his work. So when I saw that name next to, you know, being attributed to similarities with Alistair, I said, well, let me learn some more because that's quite curious. Because I know how Kafka was. He was a, he was a, they're, they're all eccentric. They're all very eccentric, right? And and that is how Alistair Gray is also described. He He went to art school. So those drawings that you saw are his work. I mean, they're not great. No, but he has this, that's his <laughs> style, right? That's his style. Um, he has a, that same style of um, art. He actually has a stained glass mural in the Oran Moor in Glasgow. And it's on the ceiling and it's blue and it has a woman that is very much like kind of the drawing that you get of Bella, except she's in the nude and like all this stuff. And if you look at his other works and, and book covers, that, those are his. Those are his his um, interpretations. I didn't know if you were going to talk. I didn't want to cut you off. Sorry. No, I just m mumbled under my breath. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm just making sure. I also want to read you... He has a, let me find it, sorry. He has a book called Janine, and it was published in 1984, and it is somewhat touted at his, as his best work, but it is expressed, this is what the story is about. The stream of consci consciousness narrative, um, so I'm guessing that's kind of like how it's written, like it's this, you're in this person's head, this guy. Um, the narrative depicts Jock McLeish, a middle-aged conservative. conservative. Jeez. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me. Conservative security supervisor who is dependent on alcohol and describes how people in sectors of society are controlled against their best interest over a background of the sadomasochist fantasies that McLeish concocts to distract himself from his misery. So his themes and his writing are all about challenging these narratives. And a lot of them use some type of sexual method to do so. And so it begs me to be curious of what he's try what he was trying to get across. Mm -hmm. And I think a yeah. lot of it lies in, I honestly think he wanted to press the fact that sex is never a bad thing, no matter who is acting on it, as long as it's consensual. Because it made me reflect on the book and the movie, and Bella was always in her power of allowing these things to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I don't know. I kind of, once reading about some of his, like the synopsis, synopsi from his other books, I was like, you know, maybe he's, he's just wanting to push and challenge that narrative of our, of our, you know, missionary man and woman only theme, because he was also a socialist. He, he, he was very, um, Scottish nationalism and stuff and, you know, England and Scotland have a very deep, dark history. And I think he was living in his, like, the church is telling you this, but, you know, historically, that's not how things are. Like, and so I think he was using these themes to fight the politics around, you know, church and state and these things that are being subjected onto us. And really challenging them so once you i think he did a good job 
with only reading one of his works and then only seeing the other synopsises, uh, honestly, I do. I do think that. And, and as much as the movie is different and frustrating, number one frustration with the movie, though, they put it in London. Did they? Yeah, the house, uh, God, God's house, Godwin's house is in London. It's not in Glasgow. And that made me so angry. And the accents weren't very good. Um, yeah. All the other acting superb. Accents, meh. The only person who did a good job was God's character, because he actually sounded kind of Scottish, um, with some of his vowels, at least. I think it I think it did a good job. And, oh, shit, I forgot where I was going with that. I don't know. We'll just cut it off there. <laughs> when I'm editing later, I'm like, that's what you're going to say, Bobby. Damn it. <laughs> but no, I, I do think it did a good job because of the, just making you think, right? Because I I can see how this movie is being discussed as like a feminine prize because, you know, Emma Stone's character, Bella, um, does as she desires and doesn't back down. And... You know, even in the movie, and I'm paraphrasing this line because it's not exact, when, when she gets called a whore, her her and her friend are walking and she gets called a whore, and she basically says, we're the maker of our own future. You know? Yeah. Like, this is this is it. Um, as they were on their way to a socialist meeting. As they were on their way to a socialist meeting, yes. <laughs> and I think that it uses a split and overly performances to demonstrate that women can and should hold their own power but that this this type of thing is what forces people to pay attention right because if if this movie was a story about a young female doctor pushing her way to the top of her class we've seen those movies who cares who's going to talk about those like what like we don't you know we know that there's tons of brilliant women who have done that but using this this story and having it be packed with a strange and brilliant sexual context will make people notice and those who only see the sexual nature and perhaps agree with the small-minded men i think they should speak up so smart women can avoid them point blank let this be let this weed out the people that are so small minded. I mean, it's a I agree. Speak up on your opinions so I know who you are, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just love the end of the book so much that they they took out, right? So mm -hmm. the idea of her being like, Yeah, my husband wrote this because he was such a small, insignificant person. That he literally couldn't hold a candle to who I was. He had to pretend like I was some sort of Frankenstein monster. Mm hmm I, think I feel like there had to have been a different way to incorporate that. Yep. You know? I, Do you think it's I, better they left it behind? No, I don't. I'm, I'm bummed oh. that they didn't come back. And I really wish they would have just, like, sucked out of the fantastical world to a woman... Furiously writing, reading a book. <laughs> furiously writing and being like, "This never happens." I, you know, and then on the back, uh, behind her, you see this wall of awards and achievements and and things like that, and that she's like in some university as this high ranking professor or in this surgic like, and she's in surgery or anything else, anything else than how the movie ended to show Agreed. and solidify Agreed. the fact that this is from the mind of, of a small, insecure man. And yep. none of it happened. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just wrote the most beautiful ending. That would have been the most beautiful imagery. Mm -hmm. Her just aggressively with a big peacock feather and it's just like pa, 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 pa. <laughs> yes just be like absolutely not this is inaccurate um and and the reason i say that is because i mean when i read that in the, or listened to that part in the book i was like fuck yes <laughs> fuck yes i think that was like this my accomplishments 
Yeah, she's like, my accomplishments were so extreme that he had to go and write this book that I was a beautiful retard. Mm-hmm. Yep. To make himself feel better in his dying days. Yep. Yeah. I just... And I think it would have added five minutes to the movie and then just chef's kiss. Yeah. You could have taken out one sex scene to have this beautiful ending. Yeah, I agree. But, yeah. All right, so we're in agreement about at least that part. Oh, yeah, big time. I will say, though, I do think you have fairly changed my mind about this movie in the way that I viewed it. Yeah. I do still think that the person who made this movie... The director? Yuck, but, yeah. So, um, so there's... There is a lot of theories that in Hollywood that when directors make certain types of movies, it's because either they want to be doing it or they just want to see it done. I'll leave it at that and I'll let your mind run wild with what that could mean. Yeah, I don't, t I don't, I like to think the best of people and it's probably a flaw. It is a flaw. We'll just go with that. It's a flaw. <laughs> um, Yargos... Lanthimos is the director. Historically, um, he writes about very tough topics um, in these very bizarre way, and that they a lot of them do focus on like this childlike thing and this weird growth. Um, yeah, his first his first movie was Dog Tooth, um, and it's about a controlling and manipulative father that locks his three adult offspring in a state of perpetual childhood by keeping them prisoner within the sprawling family compound. It talks a lot about incest, captivity, and just themes about forcing children to stay. Um, in an adolescent mindset. So having not seen that movie, I haven't seen it. I don't know if you have. I haven't, but I was reading up on Yorgo to kind of understand this movie. And these are some of the things that I came across. Why would you make a movie like that? Like, I, I don't mean like, why is it in existence? I mean, like, what what's your intention behind that? Is this a common issue that we're seeing? Is this a hyperbole of parents keeping their kids helpless or is it a fantasy i personally think that it is using a theatrical method to highlight things that actually happen in the world but have people see them and Maybe make it in a way that is so, how, am I, how do I say this? People don't want to pay attention to the atrocities in the world. And so making a movie that's theatrical and kind of strange, but holds some of these elements, some of these truths, uh, will I feel will, could reach more people than just being like, it's not the news, it's not anything. I think it's a way to ha give people these themes and uncover atrocities and truths of the world without people feeling like it's so in their face because you're given the choice to go see the movie you're given the choice to go in and try and understand these themes um and whether you catch them or not is totally i think individualized for whoever's watching it but you know, people have so many opinions about the news these days, and so many people avoid the news because they don't want to see these atrocities. They don't they don't want them to be in their face. They don't want to face reality of how the world can and is. Um, so, I don't know. I feel like it's more that to me. Uh, of course, I haven't seen all of his work. Um, I've only seen this movie that I'm aware of. I, I None of the other movies, like, popped out to me of at all actually 
I think it's actually, it could be, I hope he's not a weirdo, but, uh, um, but maybe if something happened to him in, in his life where he was like, people need to see this and this is his creative method to, to, to show a truth that he wants to, to give the world and, and in a less traumatizing way than maybe he experienced or saw it. I don't know. Um, but again, like I said, I, I try to think the the best of people, especially when they're strangers, because they haven't given me any personal information to glean um, thoughts. But I do know that his almost all of his work is just as strange and bizarre as this movie, as Poor Things. I love that you're such an optimist. I am very cynical when it comes to anything Hollywood. Anything and everything. Uh, yeah. Side eye. <laughs> yeah. Very cynical about intentions, people. Um, but that might be a topic for another day. I can see why. I can understand why. <laughs> but overall, would you recommend this movie? No. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I just can't. It's the same reason I wouldn't recommend a single romance book that I read to anybody else. That's fair. And it's it's just... I guess I don't know enough analytical people that would be like, appreciate the, th like the cinematography of it and see what you saw in the movie. So, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it would, I would be very... I can think of like three people off the top of my head that I would be like, yeah, you can go see that movie and you'll probably appreciate it. <laughs> it's a small group of people. It's a very small group of people. Yeah. You want to know? Uh, so I know you saw this with your mom, which. <laughs> wow. Glad your dad wasn't there. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that he stayed home and babysat. Yeah. <laughs> and. I saw this with Jacob. How many people were in the theater with you and your mom? There's two in the same row, four behind us. Maybe eight to ten people in the theater. Yeah. So when the movie started, when we got there, there was one other person, one one older gentleman. And then a, uh, two other people walked in. But they left before the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like oh that's fantastic <laughs> yeah so quite curious but if you've seen poor things or read the book leave your thoughts down below in the comment section be sure to like this video and subscribe and come back for more because we love to talk about film adaptations. We have a couple other on our uh, playlist too. I will link them up top. But I'd be very, very interested to hear from other people who have seen this movie and what their thoughts are about it and what they what their main takeaway was. So be sure to leave those in the comments and until next time, keep reading.